dear students uh, we are now moving to the second part of the poem progress of poesy we have finished all the three stanzas of first part now let's discuss or let's go through the second part so begin let me begin with the first stanza so first uh, in the second part now uh, the poet has changed its mood in the first part he was talking about the origin of the poetry or he was talking about the uh, effects of the poetry and now uh, he is talking about that how we have been full of sorrows in our life and how poetry can be a refuse from all these said parts of life so uh, let's begin the poet begins it with the phrase man's feeble race uh, actually uh, gray gives a note over this line to compensate the real and imaginary ills of life the muse was given to mankind by the same providence that sends the day by its cheerful presence to dispel the gloom and terrors of the night this is what gray tells about this particular phrase that man's feeble race okay so like most of the justifications in the poem this is too is a familiar idea for instance we read in church sermon music served to quiet and calm the unruly passions of men to alleviate and troubles of life to ease its labors to abate the rigors of adversity and heighten enjoyments of prosperity okay so uh, let's begin the stanza man's feeble race what ills await so how much evils how much ills are there in the life and man's feeble race the weak race of human being what are we we are actually no one but a compensative uh, feeble weak uh, pe human beings which are actually suffering from various kind of illness or various kind of uh, evils and we await we wait we have to meet them some or other day so we all wait for them uh, labor and penury and the wrecks of pain and what are these uh, evils these evils include labor that is hard toil penury the extreme poverty um, wrecks of pain the acute pangs of physical suffering disease and sorrows weeping train and the cheerful misfortune which are a train a continuity of sorrows weeping and train and death that is the sad refuse from the storms of fate and finally after all these sorrows the healing for these sorrows is death which is a sad refuse which is a tragic fact even though it provides an escape from a source of fate that we know that we are going to survive we are going to save ourselves uh, um, over um, these uh, ills or evils of life by moving towards death but that is a sad refuse because death itself is not, not, not nothing beautiful okay uh, death sad refuse from the storms of fate from the storms of fate that provides us a refuse that is again a sad refuse the fond complaint my song disprove and justify the laws of joe the fond complaint the fond complaint the foolish complaint the kind of complaint which is actually foolish so my song my poem what is it doing it rejects these complaints and justify the laws of joe justifies the god ways of god to men as we already seen in paradise lost that milton uses the phrase justify the laws of god the ways of god to men okay so my poetic compos composition it show that to show that this complaint against human life is foolish and false this my song disapproves it okay and it justifies it proves that the laws by which the god governs human beings are just why he is saying that this is just say he has he given in vain the heavenly muse so tell my readers whether the providence or god has bestowed the heavenly muse of poetry upon human beings in vain or whether the muse compassionates uh, the human race for um, 
all the evils of life so are we not compens com uh, compensated by the music in the these ills of life so why we should complain always for our uh, ills or evils in the life night on all her sickly dews her scepter swain the birds of boding cry and uh, when night comes it's all you know sceptered vein it's all unhealthy and unwholesome vapors birds of boding cry it's pale ghost and the birds whose cry is an omen of misfortune ill omen like the crying of owls okay ill omens of life and um, he gives the to range the dreary sky so when the night comes the unhealthy the unwholesome vapors the pale ghosts and birds whose cry is an omen of some coming misfortune are permitted by flea when they see he gives range to the dreary sky he gives range he gives place to the dreary that dreadful sky till down the eastern cliffs are far till down uh, there in the eastern cliffs, cliffs apart uh, in the distant mountains of the east hyperians march they spy and glittering shafts of war they see the rising of the sun that is hyperian god sun god and its radiant beams they spy they see and glittering shafts of war and they see the glittering shafts of the muse of poetry it makes war on the hills of mankind and brings comfort to human beings in other words what sunrise to the terrors of night so is poetry to the evils of life so the bright sunbeams which are like a uh, glittering shaft like glittering glittering arrows that aim at the gloom and terrors of light and hyperion's march hyperion is one of the titans who was the sun god and who wages war against night and its terror and the muse wages war against man's ill so poetry is compared to the sun so the darkness of human mind and other evils are scattered and dispelled by the heavenly muse by whose aid we are enabled to understand god's purpose okay now let's move to the second stanza of second part in climbs beyond the solar road where shaggy forms over ice built mountains roam the muse has broke the twilight gloom in climbs in the climate in the areas beyond the solar road in the arctic region beyond the path of sun because there are some places where sun does not rise for months okay there are parts on the earth where they do not have sunrise on a daily basis so in the climb in the re in uh, the territories regions where solar road or sun does not uh, gives its path where shaggy forms or ice built mountains roam where shaggy forms where rough forms they f uh, f are formed on the mountains that are ice built so where there are you know uh, many shaggy forms native clad in furs of animal or natives with their unkempt beard so the people who live in those arctic areas they are very shaggy they do not have you know a proper uh, dress up they do not have a proper you know looks they do not have proper shaving so the animals and the human beings people alike they are moving with the shaggy forms the native clad in furs of animals or natives with their unkempt beards okay the muse has brought the twilight gloom to cheer the shivering natives dull abroad there again poetry has dispelled the gloom the darkness the semi darkness of twilight in order to provide some entertainment to the shivering natives in their cheerless dwellings so okay so dryden also has mentioned a uh, similar kind of lines um, in his poem and uh, the phrase solar road it has been adapted from virgil he is derived from virgil and petrarch um where virgil writes beyond the parts of the ear and the sun and uh, petrarch writes all remote from the solar road and dryden also has written similar lines um out of uh, the solar walk and heavens heavens highway and pope has wrote far as the solar walk so uh, this these all poets they give references to the arctic 
regions where the sun shines only for six months in a year. Okay. So there again, what is relaxation or what is the abode or what is the shelter that is poetry. To cheer the shivering natives, dull abode, dull living places and oft beneath the odorous shade of Chile's boundless forest laid and often in the odorous fragrant shades of the vast Chilean forest. Okay. Late she, uh, she times to hear the savage youth repeat. There again muse lies down and feels pleased to hear the savage or the barber or uncivilized youth repeating or reciting in loose numbers, wildly sweet. Poetry is in mo um, uh, loose numbers in uh, not a very uh, you know strict metrical pattern and not rigidly connected but they sing uh, on their own in some loose numbers but sweet verses okay they do not follow neither of a rigid metrical pattern nor rigorously interconnected and uh, but they are wildly sweet although they are wild but they are sweet he uses oxymoron here uh, their feathers sing uh, cinctured chiefs and dusky loves and in honor to their feathers cinctured chief that is no ch their chieftains wearing girdles made of feathers and uh, dusky loves their dark complexion mistress because the climate is extreme so the complexion is also dark there so in honor of their dark complexion sweethearts and their tribal chiefs wearing girdle of feathers there are youth there are young people who used to wear uh, who used to sing wildly sweet songs while so poetry is again a relaxation there her track wherever the goddess rose glow pursue glory pursue and generous shame the unconquerable mind and freedom's holy fame so wherever the muses of poetry rose it travels glory pursue the path is recognized by glory and generous shame and uh, rightful knowledge of what is honorable right sense of what is dishonorable the unconquerable mind and freedom's holy flame the mind which cannot be slaved and the holy flame of liberty so uh, so the holy flame of liberty now he talks about um, like uh, this form is as follows um, Wherever the goddess robes, glory and generous shame, the unconquerable mind and freedom's holy flame pursue her track. That is, the muse is followed by glory, by rightful sense of what is honorable and what is dishonorable, by the unconquerable mind and by freedom. And when he talks about freedom and shame, the word is here used to mean a fear of disgrace or a fear of the loss of reputation. Shame is used in self and when he talks about freedom, it talks about freedom uh, like um, he talks about liberty that was achieved in Italy now the progress of poetry from Greek to Italy and from Italy to Britain okay uh, like Chaucer was influenced by Dante in Italy and Petrarch also influenced many writer Surrey and Wyatt uh, they visited Italy and Spencer and Mickley Milter were influenced by them and uh, again the French effect arrived so these are all the effects on the poetry and he talks about those poets who are now now he is moving from uh, Greek to Italy okay so now Gray what he gives note in the neck for the next stanza the third stanza of the second part uh, Gray uh, gives notes about that that progress of poetry from Greece to Italy and from Italy to England Chaucer was now not unacquainted with the writings of Dante or Petrarch the Earl of Surrey and Sir Thomas Wyatt had traveled in Italy and formed their taste there Spencer imitated the Italian writers Milton improved them and uh, his school expired soon after the restoration and a new one arose on the French model which was subsisted ever since. Okay, so now he talks about the Italian writers who have influenced the uh, European or the English writer. Woods that wave over Delphi's stem. So poetry that was, uh, you know, 
waving that uh, that was flourishing on in the woods over Delphi's steep steep over Delphi's steep Delphi was an ancient oracle shrine and uh, 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 passing of Ap Apollo the god of poetry on Mount Parnassus. Um, this allusion suitably introduces Gray's reference to the kinds of Greek poetry, the lyrical poets, Sappho, Eliquis, and Simonida, um, Simonides associate with the Aegean islands and the tragic drama of Athens and epic poetry associate with, with Asia Minor. So, um, Delphi is actually an oracle and um, ancient oracular shrine uh, of God Apollo, the god of poetry on Mount Paranesis. Okay, so the words idea here is that on the words that were growing on Mount Paranesis, where they were situated, an auricular shrine of Apollo at Delphi, uh, isles that crowned the Aegean deep, and islands that were crowned that flourished in the Aegean Sea, fields that cool Elysis leaves fields that is um, washed by the cool waters of river Elysis or where Mender's amber waves in lingering labyrinths creep or where uh, in the region through which flowed the slow muddy waters of the river Meander flowing in a zigzag course. Uh, the following homes of ancient, ancient Greek poetry have been mentioned in these lines, the oracle of Apollo the god of poetry at Delphi, the Aegean islands where were born Apollo, Alecius, Sappho, Athens, uh, famous for tragedy in Asia Minor, whence became the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay, so uh, he talks about these places in these lines in the uh, in the lingering labyrinths creep, the mazy paths it creeps. So the river meander, which is um, in its pure waves, which is moving in the labyrinth, in the mazy paths, creeping, crawling. How do your tuneful echoes languish, mute but to the voice of anguish? But how come these places or these homes of poetry no more rings with e musical echoes? They are silent. If at all they send any echoes, it is the voices of sorrow and pain. That is anguish, sorrow and pain. So how come the musical voice has been mute here, has been silent here in these places? So in Greek, Poetry is no more existing now, where each old poetic mind tame inspiration breathed, uh, breathed around every shade and hallowed fountain murmured deep a sullen sound. Each old mountain in these regions was actually uh, each old poetic mountain inspiration breathed around, which was actually pregnant with the poetry and served as a source of inspiration to the poet. Every shade and hallowed fountain, every shade, every tree and every sacred fountain murmured deep a solemn sound. It murmured deep, solemn, serious and murmuring sounds of poetry till the said nine in Greece's evil hour. Till the said nine, the said nine, the said nine goddesses of poetry, nine muses of poetry feeling overcome in Greece's evil hour feeling overcome by grief in the evil hour in the ill times of grief left their parents for the Latinian plains and it left their parents the Mount Paranassus the abode on Mount Paranassus which was the uh, where situated the shrine of Lord Apollo and moved to the plains of Italy alike they scorn the pomp of tyrant power and the muses felt equally scornful of the proud display of tyrannical power of Italian ruler so there also muses could not survive for longer and uh, coward vice and vices that were actually coward that were tricky so I uh, disapproved the cynical and sinful and cowardly people that revels in her chains that took pleasure in her chains that took pleasure into slavery when Latium had her lofty spirit lost and therefore when Rome or Latin or Italy has also lost its noble spirit they sought O Albion next thy sea encircled coast the muses now found refuse O Albion 
O Albion, uh, O British Island, as their refuse, as the refuse to refuse from those um, the British uh, islands. It said uh, required refuse in the British island. So. The idea here is that poetry was one flourished in woods growing and swaying upon the Mount Paranassus at Greek, where which was situated the oracle shrine of Apollo at Delphi. It flourished in the islands of Aegean Sea. It flourished in the fields washed by cool waters of the river Ilissus and in the region through which flowed the slow, muddy waters of the river Meander flowing a zigzag course. But no more do these homes of poetry ring with musical echoes. They are silent and at if at all they send any echoes that are the voices of sorrow and pain and each old mountain in these regions was pregnant with poetry and served as a source of inspiration to poets every shade and every sacred mountain fountain there was a source of deep solemn and murmuring sounds of poetry till upon the loss of freedom by greek and nine muses feeling overcome by grief gave they were their abode on mount paranassus and moved to the plains of italy and from there on also the muses felt equally scornful of the proud display of tyrannical power of italian rulers and they disapproved of the cowardly and sinful people who enjoyed their slavery therefore when rome lost its noble spirit the muses sought the british eyes as their refuse so here ends the second part and all the three stanzas which uh, talk about the movement of poetry from greek to italy and italy to england and now in the third part we will talk about the great writers of england so we'll discuss the third part into the next section next lecture thank you thank you very much